Welcome to all. Uh, this is the second webinar in our series sponsored by the Informs Practice section entitled Sustaining Outstanding Analytics Organizations. It's a companion to our other webinar series, Advanced Analytics Success Stories. My name is Arnie Greenland, and as a member of the board of the Informs Practice section, I'm organizing and hosting these sessions. Uh, we will run them in a conversational format. I'm currently professor of practice at the Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. But prior to that, I was an active analytics practitioner for nearly 40 years and retired from IBM in 2014. We are honored today to have as our guest speaker, Dr. Erica Clample, Director of Operations Analytics at Ford Motor Company, which includes an, ex an ex which had, in which she did an extensive list of applications which I so, was so long that I suggest you go to the website to read that list. Erica started her career at Ford in research and advanced engineering, working over a decade, developing uh, OR analytics and other techniques to inform business strategy, strengthen environmental sustainability, and improve manufacturing efficiency. She took a hiatus from analytics and led the Ford Mobility Initiative, and then started Ford's human-centered design lab in Palo Alto. She is now back to analytics at Ford as the Director of Operations Analytics. She received her PhD in computational and applied mathematics from Rice University, and has been active in INFORMS, including the INFORMS Analytics Conference Chair, INFORMS Prize Committee Chair, and twice as a finalist for the INFORMS Daniel H. Wagner Prize. And mentioning that prize, I'm gonna take one moment uh, to share my screen and uh, talk uh, just a second about the uh, INFORMS section on practice, the official name for the practice section. So you can see our purpose is to support and help advance the practice of analytics operations research and management science. Uh, focus on practice. Uh, we are the uh, group within INFORMS that administers the Edelman Prize, the Wagner Prize, Smith Prize. We have two webinar series, which you can see on the screen, the upcoming speakers, um, a monthly um, networking happy hour, uh, a practice section track at the INFORMS annual meeting, as well as a newsletter. So there's a lot going on. And for, for those who may not already be members, please consider uh, membership. So uh, one last uh, logistical thing, if you have questions, please enter them into the Q&A, which you'll find uh, as one of the uh, icons on the screen. And without any further ado, let's get started. Uh, so to start our conversation, Erica, would you please share with our virtual audience today, your analytics journey in the many years you have been at Ford and how your role has evolved over that time period. Yeah, thanks, Arnie. I'm glad to be here with you today. Um, I started at Ford in 2000, right out, out of graduate school and started in a technical role. Uh, analytics was in small pockets in the company at that time. It was decentralized. Um, and I was in a small group that was housed in research and advanced engineering. Uh, my primary role was building mathematical models. So I enjoyed um, using what I'd learned in school actually to, to apply at Ford. I did a lot of work with manufacturing to help with efficiency, uh, helped when Ford was going through restructuring uh, in 2005 and six. Um, and I also started the sustainability and analytics initiative at Ford, which uh, was really rewarding to help um, Ford be a more sustainable company and how we uh, reached increasingly more stringent CO2 targets over time. Uh, one of the interesting model outputs was recommending that the F-150 go aluminum, uh, which you can see in the marketplace today. Uh, so I did that for the first decade or so. Um, I then, as you, you mentioned, uh, I left analytics uh, to launch the mobility initiative for Ford. And this was quite a big shift in type of work. Um, but it was really enlightening to be on the other side of the organization, the side where we created strategy, um, uh, drove what was needed for the business. Um, and at the same time, I was able to help identify what are the analytics required to help solve the mobility uh, business problems 
and started a small analytics group within, within mobility. At the time, it was another one of the decentralized analytics teams. This was a really great learning experience, helped me learn and understand better like the business side and the pressures um, ahead of returning to analytics. Uh, I then started a human-centered design lab uh, for Ford and Palo Alto. It was formerly called Greenfield Labs. Uh, it's now called D Ford in Palo Alto. This was also quite the divergent path, um, but another really great learning experience. It really helped me understand the importance of how do you design for the user? How do you quickly iterate with low fidelity prototypes? Um, and how you don't get too far down the development journey without really engaging the user and understanding what they need. Um, those were also really great learnings for coming back to the analytics side. I, I know sometimes we get excited about developing cool analytics, um, but it's really important to make sure we're solving the right problems for the users, iterating quickly to really get to what adds value for the user. So in 2018, I returned to analytics. Um, by that time, the GDI organization was up and running. I'm now the director of operations analytics uh, with a team in Dearborn, Chennai, and Germany. Uh, we support many different aspects of the business. Um, it's an exciting time to be at Ford. Uh, support manufacturing, quality. As you mentioned, it's a, a long list, reliability, safety, sustainability, uh, even human resources, finance, purchasing, logistics, and many more. Great, great, very interesting uh, uh, evolution and, 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 and also having uh, experience in the larger corporation is always a positive. So what, what has been the most challenging problem uh, uh, Ford has faced in becoming an analytics driven organization? Yeah, maybe I'll first talk a little bit how analytics has evolved at Ford over time. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, Analytics was decentralized when I first joined in 2000. There were small pockets of analytics teams throughout the company, uh, primarily in Ford Credit, marketing, research, and, and advanced engineering. Uh, in 2015, the analytics resources were centralized. And this is when the Global Data Insights and Analytics skill team was created, uh, and a chief data and analytics officer position was created. This really helped us centralize tools, training, best practices, hiring, onboarding, and I think most importantly, gave a career path for data scientists. Um, being embedded in other organizations, uh, you know, your career path, you were always going up against someone with an engineering degree or a marketing degree, and it was really hard to compare data scientists to uh, business practitioners. So I think it, it really was a great way of of providing career paths for data scientists. Um, since 2015, the central team has grown significantly in, in numbers um, and significantly in having impact across the company. Um, in 2021, one of the changes to the organization is that we, we had an IT team that supported putting our analytic solutions into production. And that team was merged into, GDI, into the GDIA skill team. Um, and that's been, I think, a really important move um, for helping us have more widespread analytics. Um, while we've centralized analytics, we've also worked to democratize analytics into the business for more of the citizen data science sort of, of projects that need to be done, where maybe the you know, data is well curated and BI tools can be used. I know many companies go through this debate of whether to centralize or decentralize their analytics resources. Uh, there are definitely pros and cons to both. Um, when you're decentralized, you're really embedded with the business and you know, seemingly all on, on one team and that can have benefits. Um, but it really depends, I think, on the size of the company, how the company's organized and what the corporate goals are, whether centralized or decentralized uh, is, is the best way to organize. Um, you asked, what is the most challenging problem Ford has faced in, in becoming an analytics-driven organization? Um, I would say that since I've been at Ford, we've always strived to be a data-driven organization. Um, however, the underlying data, I would say in data ontology or common data models has been the key bottleneck in really being able to reach analytics superiority um, 
I'm sure like most companies, we started with scattered Excel spreadsheets, disparate databases. Uh, we next moved to create a data lake, which quickly became a data slump. Um, mm -hmm. and, and now we're moving to a data factory. And, and this is the progress that's underway to really um, modernize this, to have what we call our own organic digital manufacturing plant uh, that produces information and knowledge to um, help the enterprise with no, both known goals and unknown opportunities. And the focus is on data quality, data standards, common data models, uh, data discovery and, and quick data access, but also data governance. So I would say that's been um, one of the most challenging problems we faced. That, that is quite a journey. Uh, and uh, I'm sure a, a tremendous amount of work, effort, energy went into making those kinds of uh, transitions over time. So what has been the impact and commitment of senior level management in this progress that you made? And how important has that been to your success? Yeah, I would say this has been key. Uh, we would have never centrally organized without the support at the, the CEO level. Uh, when the skill team was created, the then CEO, Mark Fields, was a supporter and sponsor and, and also helped create that chief data and analytics officer position. Um, we continued the growth of GDIA uh, under Jim, Jim Hackett. Uh, he also had uh, great support and recognition for the importance of analytics. Our now CEO, Jim Farley, um, you know, he, he is also a big supporter. Uh, and also, um, you know, Farley will say he gets geeked up about data and analytics. It's one of the areas he gets excited about. Uh, and the team is critical for our Ford Plus plan around modernizing everywhere, um, thinking of data and analytics first, and also unleashing the power of AI to really push the boundaries in the company. So we're, we're really lucky to have the continued uh, CEO level support of analytics at Ford and the recognition of the importance of delivering Ford objectives. Very interesting. So let's focus a little now on the analytics organization that you've been involved with. Would you share with the audience today your approach to building the analytics workforce? For example, are you hiring or growing the talent internally or is it a combination of both? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people can empathize with getting top talent today. It's, probably, it's a key challenge in today's market uh, so it's important to have a combination of experienced professionals with domain expertise, uh, while also ensuring that the, the pipeline of new talent is full. I'd say talent and talent acquisition and retention is probably what keeps me most up at night. Um, the job market is hot for data scientists, which is great. Um, that with, a, with the current generation likes to change companies probably every three to five years. So at Ford, we've had to shift our mindset and policies from a Ford lifer perspective that, you know, all people come to, to Ford to stay their whole career. Um, that, that was actually very common. There are still Ford lifers, um, but that's translated into us having to have, to focus on things like meaningful work to attract talent. I think that's one thing that, um, Ford does well, providing great experiences and challenging problems to work on, and lots of options for folks with different preferences. So you can work in multiple areas or you can stay in one domain. You can go into a deep technical path or you could go more broadly. Um, so there are a lot of, I think, interesting people like to work where there are interesting problems. Um, we've also had to go to, before it was, you have an open position, you fill it. Uh, where now we're, we're going to a continuous pipeline of talent. Um, that's key to, to keep the talent um, coming in. Um, also looking at onboarding policies uh, that get people up to speed quickly so they can provide value right away, you know, especially if we're only gonna have them for a few years. Um, so those are a few of the things we also, you know, for our internal talent, there's both upskilling and reskilling. So when we think of upskilling, it's continuous learning for our analytics professionals. They wanna um, learn new methodology or new techniques 
uh, and we have a specific time during the week set aside. We call it power up time where people can uh, work on training to keep their skills fresh. <clears throat> also reskilling, you can think of that as uh, people from Ford who come from adjacent skills that, that are able to reskill into, an, into the analytics field. And we have people from engineering who are, are technical, have have experience modeling or, or folks from IT who have great programming skills, um, machine learning skills. So we've, we've worked to reskill some folks at Ford as well. Um, it's also important, I think, to be engaged with universities, whether it's having interns, um, working with universities on research projects, that's a great way that we get access to students and talent. We also get to kind of test each other out. Um, and I think doing things like being active in professional networks is, an, is another way. Um, it's really important to understand the gaps and kind of go after those skills externally in addition to early career hires. Uh, and for example, uh, Gil Gurari is our chief data and analytics officer who was brought in in 2020. Um, and his focus was really on big data, connected vehicle data and AI strategies um, and had extensive experience in that in the past. Um, we also just hired a new chief data engineer, Jacques Dubesson from outside of Ford, who will be starting next week. Um, so we're really excited to have him on the team. So those are some examples of external uh, talent that Ford is bringing in to make sure um, that we continue to have diversity of thought, diversity of backgrounds. And I think especially to keep from just becoming internally focused and uh, potentially missing what's going on in, in other industries. So I really love the, the, the terminologies, uh, upscaling and re, or upskilling and reskilling. Uh, those are terms I'm gonna uh, put into my vocabulary. Um, okay, so, it, it's a common challenge in large organizations such as Ford that working across boundaries, such as, for example, with the IT organizations, marketing, financial services, um, is, is complicated. Can you comment on with, within Ford, are there any interesting stories you would like to share on how you've worked through challenges of this type? Sure. Um, Maybe uh, in regard to how we work with our business partners, um, I think the key is because we are centrally um, organized now, the key is building relationships and trust with some small wins um, by understanding what the team needs most, even if it's not the most sophisticated analytics. Uh, a lot of times visualization is important to first show like the current state of, what is the current state of your business, which oftentimes isn't available to teams. Uh, really understanding pain points, what is causing their biggest headache? What is the most time consuming thing for their job? What do they wish they knew? Um, this takes time understanding the business side, uh, spending time together, observing those teams while they're doing work. Um, one, one great example, I think, um, <clears throat> is what our manufacturing analytics team does. Uh, they actually spend time, well, pre-COVID, in the plants, line side, um, watching the challenges of manufacturing vehicles, right? And one of the things that came up um, is the challenges that the team leader goes through, uh, especially in the morning when they're about to start a shift or at the start of any new shift. Um, they don't always know who's gonna show up. Is everybody gonna show up? Um, and this can be very stressful when you wanna make sure you get the, you know, the plant up and running. Um, <clears throat> so the team realized, hey, we have badge in data and the manufacturing plants are big. So it takes you know, several minutes, you know, at least five minutes for people to walk from the gate into their area. So the team was able to very quickly mock up something where they, we're able to send who'd clocked in to give the team at least team lead at least five to 10 minutes um, head, heads up of who's gonna be there for the start of the shift. This is a great example of, they weren't asked to do this, 
but they observed and saw one of the big issues for the team lead, came up with something really quickly to see, hey, does this add value? And then later came the optimization and the more sophisticated analytics of, okay, if you're missing so-and-so, what is the competency matrix? Who could be mapped? How could you, you know, reallocate talent? Um, so I think building trust, having some small wins, um, and really understanding pain points is key. You mentioned IT. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we recently merged our IT folks who were supporting GDIA with GDIA into one team this year. Uh, I think that that one team mentality has helped that we have the same leadership. We all report into the chief data and analytics officer and we have the same goals. I mentioned this started in the beginning of 2021. I think there, there are some differences in culture uh, and still work that we have to do to better integrate the teams. But this is a really important step in being able to implement and bring analytics to scale it forward. Um, and that is where our IT folks excel. They know how to scale. Um, they know how to make sure solutions are robust. Uh, and so the combination of the two groups into one is going to be really powerful in allowing us to have analytics at scale. So I'm starting to begin to believe that what you just described about the merging of IT and, and analytics is, is maybe becoming a leading practice. Because um, I, I hear that and in, 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 heard that in a number of of organizations saying the same kind of move was done. So. And there is still a separate IT organization at Ford. So not all of IT merged with GDIA, um, just the folks who are really um, supporting our right. infrastructure and the productionization of our, our solutions. Yeah, that, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. Okay, very, very interesting. Um, so uh, it's clear that a lot is going on in the automotive industry, um, and especially right now. Uh, and it would certainly make sense that analytics should have a major role in, in that. Can you please provide some insights into how your work has impacted Ford's transition into new businesses and the challenges of the future? Yeah, so things that are going on uh, around new businesses. Um, Ford recently uh, launched a new business called Ford Pro, um, just within the last month or so that uh, is for commercial vehicle customers to really help them with higher productivity uh, and performance. Um, and as you can imagine, there's a, a large analytics effort uh, to support this, uh, the new services around Uptime, uptime, making sure vehicles have, you know, uptime, helping them with intelligent charging, and they rely on data and analytics for the intelligence of, of how to better manage and maintain fleets. So that's an example of a new business Ford is offering. We're also offering new services to um, individual retail customers, uh, especially with with our new battery electric vehicles. So. Um, develop, the teams are developing analytic solutions on intelligent charging. So how, where should you charge? How long should you charge to minimize the cost of charging to our customers? Um, and, and that's an exciting um, application that, that we're supporting. Um, as far as what's going on now, we know there's a lot going, everybody's experiencing COVID. So um, that, um, uncovered a lot of uh, ways in which analytics could play a role for the, for the company, whether it was in uh, supply chain recovery of helping um, understand and map where the, the disease was spreading versus where our plants are and how that, the, which areas of the supply chain might be impacted, um, intelligence on then what, what are similar parts that uh, could potentially um, be transitioned to help uh, prevent um, disruptions to part inventory. 
uh, understanding and manufacturing uh, impact of absenteeism, um, also helping with Ford understand, um, you know, when do we expect plant closures, looking at epidemiology data and understanding the impact and what that meant for Ford facilities, uh, to reforecasting what our vehicle market share might be, when we might recover. Uh, so tons of um, new insights were provided and uh, new tools were built out of that. Um, more recently, the, the fund continues with the chip shortage. Uh, so that one's not impacting everyone, but I'm sure many people have heard about um, the issues that automakers are having with the chip shortage. Um, and, you know, we have a, a team that's working with the business to develop a semiconductor shortage allocation model. Uh, and this is a multi-constraint allocation model and it helps optimize um, allocation of, we have multiple commodity constraints that are impacted by the, the chip shortage. So it helps allocate the chips to the right products to minimize the impact, uh, to make sure our vehicle inventory in certain models isn't going lower than a certain amount. Um, we've also been leveraging connected vehicle data uh, to help with Ford quality, detecting issues earlier, uh, which allows us to resolve things earlier, minimize um, impact to customers. So I could, I could keep going on and uh, it's one of my favorite topics, but I, that's why I mentioned earlier, I think it's a really exciting time to be in analytics um, and to have an impact on the business. Okay, wonderful. So um, kind of a related question. Um, the, the past year brought a lot of work environment changes. You know, literally every company has had an impact, uh, have been impacted by, by COVID. Can you share any change, any uh, ideas that, about how uh, th those things might be continued into the future or changes to the, the way workplace will be managed going forward? Yeah, I, I think that um, I was really actually, I was surprised and pleased and impressed by how quickly Ford uh, converted to working virtually. Um, you know, back in March, 2020, we were gonna do a trial work from home. Okay, let's everybody go home and, and see how it goes and see how the technology holds up. Uh, and before our trial was scheduled, we all had to go home. So, <laughs> so we, we, we never got our trial period, but I was pretty impressed by how um, seamless the technology went. I think over time though, they've brought in uh, better collaboration tools for virtual working. Um, you know, we use WebEx Teams or Slack. I know some, some companies use Microsoft Teams. So there are a lot of uh, ways that people can now engage and, um, you know, work virtually, uh, tools that we weren't using before. So that I think has been, been really great. I think, We've also learned a lot as a company on how to collaborate better globally. Um, you know, before we'd have our, our in-person meeting with a few global colleagues dialing in to WebEx, who probably felt, you know, left out of the conversation. Um, I think that's leveled the playing field. Everybody's, everybody's virtual. So um, I think that's actually increased and improved global collaboration and integration of the global teams. Um, we have a, a lot of, I think, good feedback on you know, families, getting to spend more time together with the families. I think some challenges we've faced are um, the separation of work and home, right? You're always home, so sometimes it's easy to be always on. So how do we better have barriers uh, or boundaries so that employees feel like they're off of work? Um, I think one of the bigger challenges is new employees onboarding uh, and just building those informal relationships that, you know, we all know how important it is to meet face-to-face -face or how it's easy to work through issues, 
if you're face to face, whether you're brainstorming or trying to, to work through a problem. So I do think um, meeting face to face is still important. So after we go back, when, when, you know, when things get back to normal, I don't think they'll be normal as in normal how they were. Um, I don't think there will be an expectation that everyone is in the office at the same time anymore like there used to be. Um, I think there, there will be flexibility to work remotely uh, and this will be geared much more to people's preferences. Of course, it'll be job dependent um, you know, if you're building the car, you've got to be in the plant. Uh, but for analytics professionals, I think we do have a lot of flexibility and we're, we're lucky. Um, I do think, though, it'll be important to strike the right balance so that people stay connected and build relationships while still being able to have a, a preference that suits individual needs. So you hear the word hybrid a lot. In this in this context, that is, in, in, as, as opposed to the old model or the, the the hybrid model, that there's something in the middle. And um, I actually saw a recent uh, uh, Kinsey report that that uh, said that the majority of 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 the workforce actually prefers a hybrid approach, which will be interesting in terms of relating it to the talent discussion we had earlier. I mean, obviously, you want to. Uh, be able to uh, attract the best talent, and maybe having a work workforce flexibility is one of those factors. Yeah, I think you're um, you're right on, Arnie. We've seen that most employees want a hybrid environment. There is a small subset of employees who just want to only work virtually. Um, you know, of course, there's another subset who really feels the need to be in all the time. Um, and I think that's, you know, for analytics professionals, there, there will be a lot of flexibility, um, of course, company dependent, but I, I know Ford is, is definitely planning on a hybrid model. And kind of changing as, as we're redoing the workplace of the future, um, indexing more on collaboration spaces. So what are the use cases of when people want to come in together? What are the the, the needs of, of folks. Yes, there's some that where you might want to go in and work in the office because you're more productive, but uh, a lot of the feedback that we're getting is that people really want to work, come into the office when they need to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, uh, and by the way, I'll, I'll just make a comment. I, I haven't seen any uh, Q&A uh, questions posted, so please feel free to do that because we are getting close. We will have time for Q&A. So uh, uh, you find the Q&A by, if you put your cursor on the screen, it, there'll be a little Q&A icon at the bottom that should show up. So uh, feel free. Uh, so here's a question that's kind of open-ended. Um, you know, you, 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 you've had a great career at Ford. Is there anything you would have done differently um, knowing what you know now? Yeah, I think that um, as far as with the GDIA organization, I think investing more in data engineers up front um, it is key. I think otherwise your data scientists will just spend most of their time doing data engineering. So um, I think, you know, we're, we're seeing the importance of that and that's probably something that I would have thought of doing differently, um, you know, versus, oh, we're starting an analytics organization, bring in all the, the brightest data scientists, right? Um, so I think data engineering is super important. It also would have helped with uh, democratization of analytics much faster. Um, so while we are a centralized organization, part of our goal is, is to democratize, I don't want to call it lightweight, but but tools where the business can um, create their own visualization. Um, and this really is need, it needs the foundational data in order for um, the democratization of those tools, whether it's AI ML tools um, or visualization tools, you really need to have the, the data sorted first. 
And so Ford is really doubling down on um, investing in data engineers. So look at fordcareers.com if you are out there. <laughs> Lots of interesting opportunities at Ford right now. Great, great. So um, what do you see the future looking like for analytics at Ford? Yeah, I see it as a key strategic advantage for Ford. Um, with our focus on connected vehicle data, we're just getting a plethora of, da of data right now that can add value in a variety of, of spaces. Uh, knowing our customer better, as I mentioned earlier, understanding quality issues to address it, uh, being able to do over-the-air updates to improve algorithms or services. Um, so connected vehicle data, I think, is, is key in the future and, uh, and, and where we're going to be uh, doubling down on. Also improving the customer experience. Um, that is enabled through data, knowing the customers better, having a seamless experience for them, helping with prognostics, helping them understand when they might need to take their car in for service or maintenance, providing them with offers or insights on products that might be most relevant for them. All of that requires analytics. Uh, so really, you know, modernizing Ford, um, I see analytics not as an option but really a requirement to deliver on the Ford initiatives. Okay, so uh, those were the uh, things that I had in mind to chat about, but um, I'm uh, looking now at the uh, Q&A sections where we have a number of questions. Feel free for those others on the call to enter a question, but for I'm gonna just start in order. Um, our uh, executive director, um, Elena Gersman has this question. Um, thinking about new hires, are you looking for bachelor's, master's, or PhDs? Yeah, Maybe great question. <laughs> yeah, we, I would say we're about right now at Ford 30%, 30%, 30% within GDIA. So we do hire, um, you know, all, all different types of degrees. Um, and it's important because we have different types of analytics work that we need done. Um, we do have deep technical career paths. A lot of those um, do require a PhD or a master's with, with a lot of experience. Um, but there are definitely roles for bachelors uh, and masters. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm going to violate what I just said. I'm going to not. I'm going to go a little out of order because a related question um, is in, what, the, this is an interesting uh, uh, question. Bill Bill Climac asked. Um, My buddy Bill. <laughs> yeah. So, how do the definitions of analytics, data scientists, operations research, and management science? Well, he said differ, but I guess I'm wondering how they all live in an environment like Ford. Yes, that would be a question Bill would ask. Um, <laughs> I think it, at Ford, it's more analytics is a catch-all, and we, we call data scientists, right? Data scientists do optimization, build models, do you know statistics, machine learning. So that all kind of combines into the data science terminology. Um, you might hear operations research. I would think that's probably maybe less used except for mm -hmm. by people who have a degree in operations research. Um, <laughs> analytics is probably more catch all. Data scientist is the type of job and data engineer is more if you know, the training to do a lot of the data fusion and merging and, and real time time data. So, yeah, I know that's a question that's always uh, on the mind, especially of informs. Um, and it has, I think, transitioned over time as well. Uh, in the early days, we did more call it operations research when we were in the pocket of research and advanced engineering but that has shifted over time.
So, um, uh, can you hear me now? Because I just had a little freeze on my, okay. Um, so Radhika Kokarni asked this question. Can you give us some examples where you have seen innovative results by combining AI and OR skills, especially with the increase in EVs and the challenging challenges coming from the need for better charging infrastructure? Yeah, that's a good question, Radhika. Um, I would say that right now, most, most of the applications are either AI-based, machine learning-based, or, um, or optimization. Um, we do have uh, a few problems where I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, um, where we're, we're looking at, in, in a lot of the, the quality space, we're using machine learning to do early detection um, of, of quality issues. Um, and hopefully that will lead to, um, you know, optimizing the root, the root cause of, of why certain issues are happening. Um, it's a good question. Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything where we're combining the two. Um, we have a lot of separate applications. Um, but I'll, I'll think of that and get back to you, Radhika, if I think of, of a good example. Okay, so here's a, a question from Pat Patricia Neary. Could you talk about how your group supports sustainability at Ford and plans for the future in this area? Yeah, so there are a lot of, um, we, we support it globally and it's different in different regions. So in Europe, there are uh, very, I would say there are more stringent um, requirements. So a lot of it is in the portfolio planning of understanding um, the attributes that are on the vehicle and what that means in terms of that vehicle's carbon footprint. Um, understanding all the rules and regulations. So there, in the US, there are different regulations there's ZEV mandates, things differ at different states. So you have to understand what your market share is, where you're selling certain quantities down to like, what is the configuration of those vehicles, right? But you have to forecast that when you're planning, what, are, what can we build so that we don't, so that we meet compliance. So we do have high level targets of um, uh, grams that we wanna get down to in addition to having making sure we meet compliance regulations. Uh, so we help a lot in both the upfront planning and optimization, but also then in where are we today in our short term, uh, because you know things happen in the market, right? So maybe you're gonna make a lot of EVs, but then the chip shortage or you know, something happens and that impacts what your plan was. So um, helping with recovery we also do things around like, you know, paint in the plant and making, you know, helping make visible, um, you know, how we're improving um, sustainability in, in the plants. So a lot of it is around product planning, but there's other work that goes on around uh, manufacturing sustainability. Uh, we also are now using connected vehicle data. In the US, there's something called off-cycle credits. So by having connected vehicle data, we can understand the vehicle usage and then provide a case to the government of what features might be helping improve um, the sustainability of the vehicle outside of the, the standard um, things that are on the vehicle, right? Like, so you might have a certain feature start, stop, right? Um, that is an efficiency. And if you can prove how it's, it's improving the, the emissions, then you can get certain credits. So there's, there's just tons of work in, in sustainability. It's quite an interesting yeah. space. Yes, it certainly is. In fact, I'm gonna use the uh, moderator uh, prerogative here because I've noticed in, um, among students uh, a tremendous amount of interest in sustainability as a driving force as to why they're interested in analytics and 
So does that, have you noticed that in younger people coming on board that it's, it's an area that they're interested in? Yes, absolutely. Um, people are really passionate about, you know, being able to use analytics to improve the environment. Um, and it's one of the things I would, I would say, uh, as far as Ford and having Bill Ford as our, our chairman, like that's something he's been passionate about his whole life. And, um, and so there's a lot of support of the company of, of driving sustainability initiatives. And there's a, a lot of then emphasis on analytics and how we can help achieve that. And a lot of people do come and you know, they, they do wanna work in that area. Interesting, cool. So uh, here's a question from Carl Kemp, who by the way is our next speaker in this series. Hi, Carl. I assume some of the uh, projects you work on are tools to replace Excel spreadsheets. How do you overcome the biases not invented here? Um, we have always done it this way. We can't understand your math, et cetera, to get your tool into the production use. Yeah, people love their Excel. Um, you know, I would say Altrix and visualization tools like Click or ClickSense have helped replace a lot of the Excel spreadsheets. We still sometimes port to Excel if people want to manipulate and do their own thing. But I think for a lot of folks, um, once they have the visualization where they don't have to do the Excel, they see the value uh, and are willing to um, transition when they see how easy it is to slice and dice and see data in different ways. And, um, and you know, I think Excel still has its use. Um, but as we are moving to a data-driven organization, there are just certain things where you lose information if somebody keeps something in Excel only on their, their desktop. And I can't say we, we have moved away from it entirely at Ford, but it is something where we will, we will not be able to modernize the company or use AIML um, unless we have the data of, of knowing what decisions were made, right? Because it doesn't do any good if you just visualize the current state, but people are off making decisions in their Excel file that doesn't come back. You can't learn then, right? You can't learn um, how people fixed things or you know what the outcome was. So it's super important to have a closed feedback loop uh, and not just have Excel sheets where the decisioning is being made in the Excel sheets. So we, we are progressing, I would say at Ford, it's vastly different than it was, um, you know, even a decade ago, but there's still work to be done there. Interesting, very, all, it seems like every company I've ever encountered has faced that same challenge, so interesting. So uh, Julie Williams asks, how does analytics work with internal design teams on new types of data to, to collect? And how does analytics work with external partners, fuel stations, charging stations, parts dealers, car wash companies, et cetera, on types of data collected? Okay, so the, the first question, Ernie, was- how, how does analytics work with internal design teams on new types of data to collect? Yeah, so a, a lot of that, comes from working with the business partners, with our partners on what, what are they trying to solve for? And a lot of times that backs out the data then of what is the data that's needed? I would say within the connected vehicle space, there's, a, there's so much data there. That's one of the most interesting, I, I would say spaces right now. You, you can't possibly get all the data real time. So you have to understand um, so a lot of the times the teams build small uh, proof of concepts to help narrow down what is the data I need to solve the problem that then will help inform, you know, in the next, you know, release of, of connected vehicle data, what needs to be sent and at what frequency. So it is a bit of an iterative process. Um, we started in the past of just getting everything, right? Um, that can be expensive and that led to our data swamp. Uh, so a, a lot of it now is understanding what is the problem we're trying to solve and then what is the data that we need 
iterating um, before investing in, in building out the data. Uh, I think you asked about third party, is it third party data providers? Or external data providers, how do we work? So we do get data from external vendors. Uh, one of the things that we are uh, working to implement right now is having certified data suppliers. So a lot of times we were getting data that, and, and having that built into the contract because we were getting data a lot of times that didn't live up to the data quality or the frequency that, that was needed. Um, but we do uh, purchase several data sources uh, and, and are working to get the right type of data in so that we don't have so much work on the, on the back end. Did I okay, miss any but, part of the question? No, I think you got it. I I uh, been having a little bit of uh, computer uh, or connect connectivity things, but I'm back. Hopefully, I'm back. Um, Dave, Dave Hunt asked this question. Um, you talked about analytics and customer experience, but are there other departments at Ford or companies in general? where analytics could be used more effectively. Our community often focuses on operations, but are there areas where analytics are underutilized? Yeah, and I guess I mostly focused on what my team works on. There's a whole nother area at Ford that supports marketing analytics. Um, and that's a pretty big initiative at Ford. We also have a team that supports Ford Credit um, and a lot of the new mobility uh, businesses. Um, I would say that the appetite for what the company needs done is always greater than the, the team we have. So one of the things that we always have to work on is prioritization. I think we could double the size of our team, which is already quite large, um, and, and still not be able to keep up with um, the the valuable insights we can be providing. But of course, there are always trade-offs, right? You can't just grow exponentially. Um, I would say that we are, at least within Ford, we have quite large analytic supports for most areas of the company. Um, I think the, there's just more that's needed. So I'm gonna do a, the uh, moderator pr uh, prerogative one more time. Um, I've always wondered about all this information that is, you know, you you, you talked about it, the, uh, I'm not sure I got the right word, but the um, uh, the data that the, that you have um, about the 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 automobiles or the trucks, the um, but that is it protected enough that, um, and therefore, my question is, is is the analytics team working on that problem or is it something that uh, that falls in into your world? Yeah, so that it doesn't fall into my world, but there is a group uh, within for the Ford GDIA team that focuses on data governance, security, um, all of the, you know, legal regulations of, um, it's quite a, a, a I would say a large group that focuses on all of that, um, making sure that we comply with not just the vehicle regulation or the data regulations in the US, but around the world, it's different uh, as you can imagine in Europe and in China, especially. So we have to have a dedicated team to make sure that we don't uh, violate any personally identified information. What does that mean? How, what does it mean differently in different areas? Um, how do we protect? And, um, and that's one of the you know, issues with data access. Not everybody has access to all data. So there are, um, there are protections on who can get access to what data uh, and at different sensitivity levels. Well, I'm glad you're working on it because I know it's something that <laughs> worries me. And that's um, another, I think, benefit of having a centralized analytics organization. Like if it was decentralized, everybody would have to be thinking through that on their own. Um, you know, to have it centralized, you, you, we have a dedicated team that is, is driving that for everyone. So that's why I don't have to know all, the, all of the 
protection and details, although we do take training on it, but you know, somebody else is really focused in handling that. Okay, great. So I have a question here from Charles Pierre. Uh, any updated analytics data on how long a charged battery is lasting for the electric trucks? Interesting question. Yes. <laughs> um, so nothing to share, but that is one of the uh, projects that my team is working on, um, understanding um, any potential impacts on battery degradation for two-way charging, especially as we're allowing um, you know, writing back to the grid or providing um, part of the charge. So um, that's definitely something that also the team is, is supporting investigating. So many interesting problems in that world. I know, it's like unlimited. It's like, it, it is unlimited. That's why I said so, we could grow the team twice the size and still have enough to work on. Okay, we are getting close to the end of the hour, but there are still a few more questions and we'll keep going until we reach the, uh, the witching hour here. So what are your views on embedding analytics resources in business teams versus having centralized analytics teams? Are there situations or contexts where one can be better than the other? Yeah, I mean, somebody mentioned the not invented here problem and, you know, um, it's always easier when you're under the same leadership with the same, you, you know, so, so from a, a a work perspective, it can be easier to have an embedded team. Um, yeah, you you're all have the same objectives, the same leadership. Um, and so I think there are some cases where having them embedded, you get to know the domains better, right? So you're, and when you know the domain better, you, you have a better handle on how to solve the problem. So I think those are some uh, positive um, reasons to embed. I think that you can get a lot of those benefits from co-location or well now we're all virtual. So co-location, <laughs> you know, maybe doesn't have the same meaning, but. Um, we're all in the me, same location, right? <laughs> yeah. I think that, you know, for a company as large as Ford, centralizing brings those benefits of the data governance, privacy, security, as I, as I mentioned, career paths, you know, there are career paths all the way up the leadership levels where that was not the case when analytics professionals were embedded. They were mostly just, I don't wanna say analytics doers, but um, just there was not a clear, um, within an analytics role, a clear progression. Um, and I think also avoiding redundancies, right? So having best practices, lesson learns, understanding the tools, who to, who to go to, getting, make, making sure you have training and um, the right courses uh, and your, your cohort. Um, those are things I think that are overwhelmingly, uh, at least in a company the size of Ford, make a difference for why centralization um, is needed. Um, yeah, and that's very, why I kind of mentioned it really depends on your company. If you have a small company or like, you know, or if you're trying to focus on a certain initiative where you want to move really quickly, well, um, you know, maybe decentralizing uh, would work. I mean, I worked 40 years and I think it, the pendulum went back and forth at least three times in that period. <laughs> so uh, one, I think we have time for just one last question. Uh, Irv Lustig wants to follow up on Bill, Bill Climax's question. How do other execs who are not in the data analytics space refer to analytics? Are they saying analytics, data science, AI, machine learning, or something else? I would say most these days, AI ML, right? Like, the hot, it's the hot uh, yeah. topic. I yeah. mean, to be truthful, yeah. Or, or data, right? Like, <laughs> um, I would say analytics is more of a secondary term. Well, uh, I think we've reached our, our, the end of our hour. Um, this has been a fascinating, uh, for me, fascinating conversation. I hope uh, the, uh, the audience has had the same experience. Um, and I want to thank you, Erica, for your time and your thoughtful uh, input, answers to all of our questions. 
And for all those who are listening, uh, come back again. We have a we have a, a webinars every every single month. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day.